Hi class, so this week we're covering part five, the economics of race, class, and gender. A report released today shines a researched light on life in Dallas County, and that life is very different economically based on race. Our Steve Pickett live in Oak Cliff to talk more about this today. Kaylee, this is the report released today, as you mentioned. It essentially says race affects your economic opportunity if you live in this county. In downtown Dallas today, the region's central business district, Chris Bolonos and Bianca Robinson stood out, and they knew it. Dallas residents like them earn less and struggle more economically. It doesn't surprise me because, again, as a country, that's just unfortunate what we've become. I think different races accept different things, not because they feel like that they are worthless, just because that they need to make a living. For a person of color to make the same as a person with a white person with a bachelor's degree, they have to get a postgraduate degree. This presentation, complete with maps and graphs and data, unveiled the Dallas area's color conflict, the economics of black, white, and brown. In Dallas County, minorities earn substantially less than whites. Here's the Dallas median income breakdown by race and ethnicity. The Center for Public Policy Priorities calls this the economic opportunity assessment. Well, I don't think that people really realize the magnitude and the extent of, of the range of issues that Dallas is facing and that we have the possibility to change if you really understand what needs to be worked on. That work includes narrowing the dollar divide for Dallas County. For every dollar earned by whites, blacks earn 54 cents, Latinos 58 cents. The economic assessment report is now being used as an instrument to push to change those figures. Our big opportunity now is to move people from dead-end jobs to living wage jobs, to put them on a career path to have a better life for their family. And frankly, this may not be news to any of you all out there because this has been a part of uh, the life here in Dallas County. But this report, again, will be moved to businesses and business owners to see if they can use it as evidence to make more change here. Reporting live, Steve Pickett, CBS 11 News. Steve, thank you. How did you first get interested in issues of gender inequality? So I was 10 when I won a prize in a storytelling competition. And my story is about a girl who beats the odds to become a prime minister. When my mother asked me why Prime Minister, I answered, because I'm a girl who can be anyone she wants to be. Suffice to say, I've changed my mind about being a politician, but for so many women today, the reality just doesn't allow them to meet their aspirations. Just 50% of women participate in the world's labor force as compared to 80% of men, in part because of legal and other types of barriers. A woman earns 75% of what a man earns doing the exact same job that he does with the same level of education. And in so many countries today, women are just woefully underrepresented in senior level positions. So the playing field is far from level, and this is of interest to me. Why are gender issues economically important? IMF research seems to suggest that higher female labor force participation boosts economic growth and raises living standards. For example, because now employers have a much larger pool of talent, both male and female talent, to choose from. New IMF research seems to suggest that actually the benefits of gender diversity may be even higher than previously estimated, because while men and women are equally talented, they bring slightly different skills to the table, and these skills are complementary. For example, women tend to be less risk averse than men, and studies have shown that gender diversity uh, on the boards of banking supervision agencies is associated with higher financial stability. So because the skills that men and women bring to the table are complementary, productivity and wages in the economy are higher when more women participate in the labor force. And this benefits everyone, men and women alike. Should we be focusing on bringing more women into the workplace then? Well, bringing more women to the workforce alone may not be enough in a world of very rapid technological change. The concern is that all these hard-won gains from economic policies to empower women may be quickly eroded if women find themselves doing the kind of jobs that are most susceptible to being displaced by technology. In fact, our new research seems to suggest that women perform more routine jobs in OECD countries across all sectors and occupations, and these are the types of routine jobs that are most susceptible to being displaced by technology. And the fact that women are underrepresented in professional and senior level positions also increases their risk of being uh, automated uh, by technology. But there are some 
bright spots. Technology may actually end up benefiting women by creating the kinds of jobs that allow them to participate in the labor force. So as we can see from both of these videos, the economic realities may be different based on your race or class. So in this first chapter in, uh, in this part of the book, the author challenges some dominant ideas about the United States and presents some facts that are ones that people in the U.S. might associate with other places in the world. So the author basically, by asking us to imagine a country is basically allowing us to see those inconsistencies in what we may believe about the U.S. and what the reality really is. The effect of reversing history also allows us to see in concrete ways where we have been and where we are returning to. And those economic realities of the past are not imagined and understanding the similarities between the past and the present can also help us to grasp our current economic climate more easily as well. Okay, so looking at the subprime and foreclosure crisis and what's happened 10 years later, we can see that the racial wealth gap has reached startling new levels. Research shows that the average wealth of white families has grown to about 84% over the past 30 years, which is 1.2 times the rate of growth for Latino households and three times the rate of black households. Also, it is projected that by the year 2043, when people of color will become the majority of the population, that the wealth divide will be doubled from 500,000 in 2013 to over a million. And by using this measure, it will take 228 years to resolve this inequality for black families, which is just 17 years shorter than the span of slavery. And it will take Latino families about 84 years to reach the same amount of wealth that white families have today. So looking at the differences or what black and Hispanic families have lost in their household wealth, black families lost about 66% and Hispanic families lost about 53% of their household wealth. What's up guys, Cindy Michelle here for Complex Hustle. Whether you associate yourself with the melting pot of minority groups in this country or not, one thing everyone comes to America for is to generate wealth and reach financial freedom. But how even is the playing field in America? A new study shows that it's not a fair playing field at all, with white Americans having the lead for centuries. A study titled The Ever-Growing Gap by the Corporation for Enterprise Development and the Institute for Policy Studies concluded that it will take black families 228 years to accumulate the same wealth as white families. The report states, if the average black family's wealth continues to grow at the same pace it has over the past 30 years, it will take black families 228 years to accumulate the same amount of wealth that white families have today. Now, if the trend continues, the average wealth accumulation in white households will grow by over $18,000 per year. Latino households will grow by about $2,000 per year and black households by just $765 a year. Now, you can even see this gap in the business world as well. Whites accumulate wealth at a 12 to 1 ratio to blacks, with African Americans having an average net worth of $11,000 compared to the $144,000 for whites. Now some groups blame the era of slavery for setting people of color back economically. Although we're years removed from slavery, many believe that the economic effects of that time still affect people of color today. A group of more than 60 organizations affiliated with the Black Lives Matter movement proposed a solution, releasing policy platform that includes reparations and breaking up banks. The platform released last Monday calls for reparations, an end to the death penalty and forgiveness of student loans. It also urges the federal government to officially acknowledge the devastating impact of 400 years of slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. Now, you may not agree with the solutions proposed by the Black Lives Matter movement, but you have to stop and realize that in a few decades from now, a majority of people in the U.S. will be people of color, but will still have less wealth than the whites they outnumber. By 2043, the year in which it's projected that people of color will make up a majority of the U.S. population, the wealth divide between white families and black and Latino families will have doubled, on average from about 500,000 in 2013 to over 1 million. Now that fact alone at least makes me want to research and explore solutions to close the wealth gap. 
whether it's backed by Black Lives Matter or not. We need a solution that both equals the playing field and doesn't diminish the wealth of those who have already attained it. So the affordable housing crisis continues unabated. One in about five renting American households spends about at least 30% of their income on housing. And the burden is even more for renters of color. So about 60% of black renters and 57% of Latino renters spend more than about 30% of their income on housing. Research is demonstrating how a broad range of implicit, invisible barriers affect very real and critical decisions in housing landscape. Generations of racialized laws, policies, and practices have imposed a racial bias on our collective normative values over time. Our minds are wired to automatically piece together information to make sense of the world around us. And as a part of this automatic process, people unconsciously internalize the patterns of inequity in our society in the form of implicit racial bias, or those attitudes are stereotypes that affect our behaviors and decision-making without our conscious awareness. So research consistently documents that current industry standards of credit scoring disadvantage borrowers of colors and that more promising practices of determining risk exist for them. And predatory practices are on the rise again. Home ownership remains a major goal for Americans across the country, and yet thousands find themselves locked out of it. Recognizing a market ripe for exploitation, large-scale investors have swooped in with high-interest seller finance deals that work as installation plans for housing. These two good-to-be-true instruments, which are unevenly regulated, are known as what we call land contracts. And while these instruments are not new, they have been predatory and designed to fail. So in these contracts, the owner of the property promises to convey legal title of the home to the buyer after a successful completion of payments towards the full purchase price of the home, which is usually about 30 years. During this time, the buyer is responsible for all aspects of home ownership, and should the buyer at any time default on payments, the seller retains the right to cancel the contract, keep all payments, and evict the buyer. Today, this exploitation has taken on new urgency as large-scale investors buy up large numbers of foreclosed homes. The other men and women in the current American class alignment are those in the top 1% of the wealth distribution. Those are the people like the bankers, hedge fund managers, and CEOs targeted by the Occupy Wall Street movement. They have been around for a long time in one form or another, but they only began to emerge as a distinct and visible group informally called the super rich in recent years. These are people with extravagant levels of consumption such as private jets, multiple 50,000 square foot mansions. Still until a few months ago, the 99% was hardly a group capable of articulating the identity of their interests. It, it contained and still contains most ordinary rich people along with middle-class professionals, factory workers, truck drivers, and miners, as well as the much poorer people who clean the houses, manicure fingernails, and maintain lawns of the affluent. So Occupy could not have happened if large swaths of the 99% had not begun to discover some common interest, or at least to put aside some of the divisions among themselves. So for decades, the most tridently promoted division within the 99% was one between what the right calls the liberal elite, and these are composed of academics, journalists, media figures, and pretty much everyone else. So the right targeted the liberal elites, which supposedly favors reckless government spending that requires oppressive levels of taxes. They support redistributive social policies and programs that reduces opportunity for the white middle class and creates ever more regulations that reduces jobs for the working class and promotes countercultural innovations like gay marriages. The liberal elite insisted conservative intellectuals look down on ordinary middle and working class Americans, finding them tasteless and politically incorrect. So the elite was the enemy, while the super rich were just like everyone else, only more focused and perhaps a little bit more connected.
In 2014, Michael Brown, an unarmed African-American teenager, was shot and killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. The U.S. Department of Justice investigation of the incident awakened the nation to the long-standing practice of local courts and police departments, criminalizing the activities of low-income people and people of color in order to generate revenue. Ferguson police routinely and disproportionately charge African-American fines and fees for parking violations, traffic violations, housing code infractions, and more. So these charges did not promote public safety. The local justice system instead employed this tactic to fund its activities by using residents as a cash source. If the fines and fees charged to residents were not paid, then the threat of jail loomed over them. The inequitable treatment of low-income residents and people of color was happening not only in Ferguson, but also around the nation, and it continues in many places today. So while debtors prisons are technically outlawed, courts and police departments have used loopholes in those laws to place people in jail for non-payment or fines and fees. So more than $50 billion in debt from fines and fees is currently being held by approximately 10 million people because of their involvement in a criminal justice system. Much of this debt is not collected because low-income people simply cannot pay. They simply don't have the money to pay, and so in turn causes state governments to spend more on the expense of trying to collect on those fines and fees that they actually take in. So poor people are being charged for fines and fees that they cannot pay, and then if they can't pay, they go to jail and then government has to spend more money either in trying to collect those fines or keeping them in jail. Since 2010, 48 states have increased civil and or criminal fees assessed on defendants. The growth of these user fees is linked to an equitable and regressive tax code that often requires little in local and state taxes from business and from the wealthy. These fees play an integral role in wealth and income inequality and contributes to the growing racial wealth gap in our country, while Black and Latina households on average own less than one thirteenth and one tenth, respectively, of the average wealth of white households. So despite a U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1983 that prohibited the practice of imprisonment for non-payment of court fines and fees, this practice is still all too common due to loopholes in the law. These loopholes allow courts to incarcerate defendants by holding them in contempt of court if they do not have the cash on hand to immediately pay the fine. The law requires that judges consider a defendant's ability to pay before determining that his or her non-payment of, of a fine or a fee is willful. However, these hearings are often not held and then when they are held, there is no consistent standard on how the defendant's actual ability to pay is evaluated. Some judges may ask a defendant if he or she smokes, and if they say yes, then they are considered able to pay because they have purchased cigarettes. Other examples include similar questions to defendants with tattoos or, or a manicure. So then the defendant who is unable to pay the fine on the spot may be placed on supervision, on probation, or in jail. And all of these punishments come with yet more fees attached to it. And in almost every state, defendants are charged fees, included, including room and board, during the time that they spend in jail or prison. And these fees can accumulate daily while the defendant waits for weeks. And the sad part is, even when a person is found not guilty or if charges are dropped, they still may be liable for the fees incurred during the stay and for the cost of a public defender. So not only are poor people getting charged with these fees and charges that they cannot pay for and punishment on top of that is only costing them more money. But let's take a look at this video to show how going to jail because they couldn't pay a fee or just going to jail affects the rest of their lives. I've been reviewing a case, honestly, it looks great, um, really not much to talk about, I think, 
have to deal with cases like this all the time and we'll be fine. questions that I have. Um, our HR team will be in contact with you um, in regards to onboarding paperwork. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Welcome to the team. Thanks. Um, and have you ever been convicted of a crime? Yes, I have. Okay. All right. So this is the backyard. It's great for entertaining guests. Um, so what do you think of the place? I love it. I would love to take it. So as we can see from the video, two different cases, they both committed the same crime, but one had the money to pay for their legal defense and the other didn't. And so the, the guy that was able to pay for a good attorney, he was able to not get any jail time um, and then he was able to get a job and get a place to live. The other person who was not able to pay for a legal defense, he was actually he went to jail right he got he had to plead guilty he went to jail he basically couldn't get a job after that and then finally got evicted so you can tell how criminalization of poverty comes into play here poor people cannot afford to pay for stuff or they cannot pay they cannot afford to pay their fines and therefore it costs them more or they're not able to afford legal defense and so they go to jail and then that affects the rest of their life and the cycle of poverty continues. Accumulated debt follows low-income people and often leads to discrimination in securing housing and obtaining jobs because many landlords and employers perform credit checks on candidates. So even in cities in states that have that have adopted ban the box policies that forbid employers from asking a person about their criminal history until a designated time after initial screening credit checks still show outstanding debt that is related to a criminal charge providing a loophole to housing and employment anti-discrimination laws and then when a person with unpaid debt does find employment their wages and taxes can be subject to garnishment and then on top of that, garnishing wages, unpaid fines and fees can also be, can also prohibit low income people from seeking other public support that might help them achieve a certain level of economic stability. So this also creates that cycle of instability and does not serve the original purpose of the fine. The justice system is also actively steering youth and their families into periods of financial hardship that can have lasting consequences. Over 20 states charge court-involved 
youth fees for investigations, monitoring, and the use of public defender. Youth with records can carry over court-imposed debt from childhood into adulthood. And a juvenile record is not automatically sealed or expunged upon release or upon the young person turning 18, which can limit their ability to get a job, be accepted into college, and receive financial aid. So juvenile court debt undermines family financial stability when it is needed the most. It pushes families that are already struggling farther into debt, which works against the stated goal of juvenile court, which is that of rehabilitation. It may seem practical for governments to turn to fines and fees to augment their budgets. However, a deeper analysis of the practice has shown that in many cases, using fines and fees usually cost the government more money than it receives. In light of the damaging and inefficient court practices, several local and state governments have enacted reforms that can help reduce the over-reliance on revenue from fines and fees assessed on low income on the low-income population. These are that they require the ability to pay hearings for all defendants. So now some states require ability to pay hearings to bring more uniformity and fairness to assessing whether the defendant is actually able to pay for those fees. They also offer flexible penalty-free payment plans. So Iowa passed legislation in 2016 that allowed for individuals with overdue court debt to enter payment plans before their driver's license was suspended for non-payment. Then there's enact amnesty period. So in 2011, California enacted a law that relieved a non-custodial parent of child support obligations during the time the person was incarcerated. Seize warrant issuance for unpaid debt. So the reforms to the fines and fees practices introduced by the Supreme Court of Ohio in 2015 um, protect Ohio residents from the risk of incarceration for unpaid debt and save court resources and staff time by reducing costs in jail populations. They also place caps on allowable revenue from fines and fees. So following the U.S. Department of Justice report on unfair policing practices and in Ferguson, Missouri in 2015, the state of Missouri passed a law that limits a municipality's ability to raise more than 12.5% of its annual revenue from traffic tickets. They also eliminated debts for juveniles. In 2015, Washington state limited municipalities' ability to charge fees to juveniles. They also connected indigent defendants to workforce development programs. So in 2008, they had a pilot program in Massachusetts that reduced court debt that reduced court debt for indigent defendants who completed job training, mental health, and or addiction programs. They also provided relief for indigent defendants as well. So in settling a lawsuit in which a woman was arrested for unpaid traffic tickets, Montgomery, Alabama agreed to a, pres a presumption of indigence. So for defendants whose income was at or below 12.5% of the federal poverty level, they provided free public defender services for debt hearings. So Montgomery, Alabama now provides public defenders in administrative hearings and outstanding debt they also eliminated bail for minor crime. In 2017, the New Orleans City Council voted to allow indigent defendants charged with minor offenses to be released without bail in its municipal court system. So those were just some of the reforms that the local and state government came up with to reduce some of the over-reliance on revenues from fines and fees for low-income populations. So changes in immigration policy in 1965 led to a dramatic shift on undocumented Latino migration. There were caps placed to restrict the numbers of immigrants from the Western Hemisphere, but the demand for workers did not slow down. So Mexicans continued to migrate. And then in the 1980s, people were driven out of Central America because of US sponsored interventions there. But in 1965, restrictions made it difficult for them to obtain legal status as refugees. And so most Central Americans came so then most Central Americans came in as undocumented migrants. With 50.5 million persons in 2010, Latinos constitute the largest minority group in the US. 
representing 16.3% of the population compared with just 12.6% for African Americans. So Mexicans alone numbered 31.8 million persons in 2010 and made up 10.3% of the U.S. population. While Latino immigrants from the Caribbean are overwhelmingly legal residents or U.S. citizens, 58% of all Mexican immigrants present in the U.S. in 2010 were unauthorized compare with, compared with 57% of those born in El Salvador, 71% of those from Guatemala, and 77% of those from Honduras. So even considering all persons of Mexican, Salvadorian, Guatemalan, and Honduran origin, the shares unauthorized stood at 21%, 38%, 50%, and 51% respectively in 2010. Between 1965 and 2000, a new Latino threat narrative came to dominate public debate and media coverage of Latinos in the U.S. And the U.S. policymakers responded by launching what Rosen has called a war on immigrants. This war involved an unprecedented militarization of the Mexico-U.S. border, a massive expansion of the immigration of the immigrant detention system and a return to mass deportations for the first time since the 1930s. Throughout the U.S. history, immigrants have periodically served as scapegoats for America's problems. They were blamed for joblessness, low wages, and high social spending, while being framed as threats to national security, owing to their supposed moral deficits, suspect ideologies, and subversive intentions. So portrayals of Latin American immigrants as a threat to American society has been greatly facilitated by the fact that a rising share of Latino immigrants are present in the country illegally, and thus readily framed as lawbreakers, criminals, and terrorists. All right, so this brings us to the end for this week. Next week, we will finish up with the rest of part five.